Africa are going to make sure that we secure this planet for future generations. We need to learn to love the people who voted for things that we might disagree with. Everything is a toxic mess. What we want is a transition out. But, you know, what we have is an addicted society. And the fossil fuel industry continues to push those addictions. This is a moment for us not to adjust to things that are so fundamentally unjust. Has the COVID-19 pandemic made you rethink your lifestyle? If this is a dress rehearsal for the climate breakdown, how are we doing? Since fleeing South Africa's apartheid, Kumi has scaled oil rigs and protested from the Arctic Ocean to the Alberta tar sands. The time of playing political poker with our planet has to be over right now. Winona has stood in opposition against coal and uranium mines, dam projects, and oil pipelines. It's not like I'm standing here as a matter of choice, I'm standing here as a matter of necessity. This is an opportunity for system redesign. What lessons can we learn from indigenous knowledge? I want to see what a new economy will look like and how people can take power over their future. I'm eager to speak about this and more with Winona on Studio B Unscripted. You know, it's a great opportunity and a privilege to be here with you. We are uh, in a very colonial city, and uh, we're a couple of anti-colonialists. Uh, we both come from long histories of, of British colonization, I would say, and uh, here we are to talk about the future in, in some times, times of tremendous change. And I think that we just had the, had the big conference in Glasgow. It's so wonderful to be with you, Winona. I think that what the COP26 has just shown us recently okay. is that we are still stuck in fundamentally a colonial mindset and in terms of colonial power dynamics. Because what we had out of COP26 was basically a sentiment that says the lives of people in the Pacific and other small island states don't matter, in the least developed countries don't matter. And the difficulty, it seems, is that those with the largest amounts of power in the conversation are not willing to recognize that the mistake they made after the global financial crisis, which was their approach was system recovery, system protection, and system maintenance. But what should have been done then and what is even more urgently needed now is system innovation, system redesign, and system transformation. I should just say, none of us should be too surprised, though, by what happened in the negotiations in Glasgow, because the shocking truth is, do you know which was the largest delegation that attended? No, I have no idea. It was the fossil fuel industry. Oh, wow. Yeah. Right? They, they had 503 lobbyists. No, you right? should always have the dealer at the table. Well, <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, I feel like what we're talking about is late stage addiction behavior. Exactly. Frankly, I mean, you know, I mean, I lived, as you have, in the fossil fuel era my entire life, and I'm looking for a graceful transition out of it. I don't want to crash my way out where I can't drink the water and I can't breathe the air and everything is a toxic mess. What we want is a transition out. But, you know, what we have is an addicted society. Uh, you know, and the fossil fuel industry continues to push those addictions. You know, I heard someone talk about the colonial imagination versus the indigenous imagination. And the colonial imagination can only figure out like within this box. And it can't get to the place where we need to get to where it's more than just the rights of corporations, you know, and it's more than just the rights of, of first world people. But it's also like, what about the rest of the world? And what about the relatives, whether they have wings or fins or roots or paws? You know, that's how you survive. Maybe Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk think they can make it without the rest of us. 
but the rest of us know that we are part of this world and that opportunity is here to make a change. No time like the present. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I yeah, figure yeah, yeah. like. And, Absolutely. And it appears that Glasgow did not bring the change. Imagine Alcoholics Anonymous having right. a global conference and the biggest delegation to the conference was the alcohol industry. Right. Or in the past, a big anti-slavery conference and the biggest delegation was slave owners. By the way, that's what it was. That's why slave owners got compensation and those who were slaves got no compensation. And this is how the climate negotiations are going. And now, you know, people like myself, when we look at where we get inspiration from, and I think that the inspiration right now is coming from young people, but it's also when you're looking at bodies and knowledge, indigenous wisdom teaches us the way out of this mess, because unless humanity can learn to coexist with nature in a mutually interdependent relationship, you know, we're not going to be around for that much longer. And I always like to tell people, don't worry about saving the planet, right? Because actually, if we continue on the suicidal path we're on, we would destroy our soil, destroy our water, warm up the planet. The end result is we will be gone as a species. Yeah. And and once the plants will be back. Yeah. And and and, and once <laughs> we become extinct, yeah. <laughs> the oceans will recover, the forests mm -hmm. will grow back, and so on. And this struggle, therefore, has to be understood as uh, saving our children and their children's futures. You know, every living being had some original instructions. We would say, "Min when take only what you need, leave the rest." Uh, be mindful, all your relatives, you know, understand the creator's law is higher than the laws of nation, states, or municipalities, and even the participants and cops. You know, you could say whatever you want, but in the end, we all got to drink the water, we all got to breathe the air. We all had those instructions. Indigenous people, you know, we're 4% of the world's population, and we're 75% of the world's biodiversity. What we need is to return to some instructions that, that say, this is how you live. You live being mindful, you live being conscious, and you protect you know, Mother Earth and not the rights of corporations. I mean, this is why you need things like the rights of nature you know, versus over the rights of corporations. My observation, I don't know if you see, but I see like catastrophes of biblical proportions. <laughs> yeah. I mean, right? Yeah. So there's, you know, fires and hurricanes and tornadoes and the oceans are rising and then, you know, a pandemic. And, you know, in the history of the world, pandemics have always forced societies to change. This one is no different. You know, what Aaron Dottie Roy says is it's a, it's a, it's a portal between one world and the next. And inasmuch as the financial crisis of 2008 was a pretty clear opportunity to acknowledge that the economic systems are, you know, made up and are failing, this moment is certainly a time when we, when we can, and, and in many ways, many of us have reset. I think we're facing uh, a worse disease than COVID-19. And that disease is a disease we could call affluenza. <laughs> and, that, and this is this that is true. where people have been led to believe that a good, meaningful, decent, happy life comes from more and more and more material acquisitions. And I think that unless we look at bodies of wisdom, including, I think, again, this is something we learn from indigenous culture, is that a good, meaningful, decent life comes from how we engage with nature, how we engage with our families, the quality of our relationships with our friends and neighbors, all of which aggressive casino capitalism has actually decimated, right? Uh, does this resonate uh, oh, with, with you? In entirely. I mean, our teachings as Anishinaabe people are minopamata ziwan, minopamata ziwan, which means the good life. It doesn't mean how much stuff you have. <laughs> yeah. You know, but there's this constant barrage that you need more, you need more, you need more, and you'll feel better. And the fact is, is that people don't feel better. You know, Americans are pretty unhappy overall. And getting more stuff just means you have to pay money to store it, <laughs> from what I can figure. So now, people who don't necessarily think like you and I do will, will, will listen to us speaking and say, well, oh, this vision is so far from what the mainstream vision of society is, right? Right. Okay, you and I have been around for more than four decades in the struggle for justice, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes, I don't know, I feel, given how much of effort one put in, that um, 
one, we should have made much, much more progress. But the forces of resistance to change are so powerful. But there's something I feel in this moment that I've never felt before. Bad as things are now, and things actually are looking much worse in terms of extreme weather events, deepening inequality, rise of fascism, um, and so on, yeah. and, and failure of democracy. But there's something very optimistic for me in this moment, and I want to see how you feel about it. And that is, I don't remember any time in my history of trying to work for justice, is that there is so many people who believe that there's a possibility this time round for major structural and systemic change. Not simply what our governments do all the time, which is rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic while humanity sinks and baby steps in the right direction when what is needed is big change. Does that resonate with what you're hearing with people in your circles? Yeah, I mean, the fact is, is that the systems are failing. I mean, if you look around the United States, which, you know, is the country which levied itself upon me, you know, you're looking over there and you have political crisis of pretty big proportions. I mean, you had an insurrection in January, right? Yeah. And, you, and then you have, you know, economic systems that fail. You have judicial and legal systems that failed us you know, have failed us consistently. And you have food systems and energy systems that fail in climate change. I mean, what is clear is that if you want to survive, you need local energy. You know, if you're expecting the grid is going to protect you, uh, the big disasters of climate change-related disasters are going to take down your grid. So so that that's a message of the power. Yeah. In, uh, in planning moving forward, we need to go to a more decentralized approach and where we put capability and control with local communities, because that's the only way we can guarantee— yeah, I mean, I must say something to you that you know, which is empire is overrated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The bigger you get, that's yeah. great. But you know what? Is that, is that at the local level is where you got to eat. Yeah. You know, at the local level is where you're going to need your solar garden that is owned collectively. At the local level is where you're going to need some essential manufacturing with just and fair trade relations, you know, between... Because, you know, an indigenous model is a, a model of biodiversity, is a model of agrobiodiversity, is a model... Because indigenous peoples, 5,000 languages, are not about building empire. They're about reaffirming relationship in place. And that is what is missing you know, with this industrial society, is there no, is no relationship and, and reciprocity with, with the world that create us, you know? But the other problem we have is the information environment within which we are operating, right? Because I would put it to you that probably there are more people that are more comfortable with imagining the end of the world as we know it and all of us disappearing off this planet than to imagine the, the end of capitalism, right? Because that's how the power of the narratives we've been fed, you know, like that's the only system that works when clearly it's not working right. for the overwhelming majority. So for me, activism is, is primarily an act of love and courage, right? right? That the activism is about saying, we look at the world and we refuse to accept that this is the best that humanity can create for itself. Mm -hmm. And one of the anxieties I have about activism today is that far too often, our energies are going towards just surviving because the repression is becoming so heavy against us and so on, and consolidating the people that already support the need for decency and the need for sustainability and respecting human rights. But I think that we don't have a choice today if we are going to make sure that we secure this planet for future generations to also say... We need to learn to, for example, love the people who voted for Trump or love the people who voted for Brexit or love the people who voted for things that uh, we might disagree with. Because I think that we need to also recognize that they are also victims, that they have been victims of lies, deceit, misinformation and so on. And we have to build a bridge. So, in any case, uh, shall, shall we wrap it up there and go and take some questions from the audience? Hi, Kumi and uh, Winona. I'm joining you from Fiji in the Pacific. Ah. Um, my question is, Pacific Indigenous peoples are bearing the brunt of the impacts of climate change. 
We are experiencing displacement of our homes and our livelihoods and our knowledge and support systems. Our kinship ties to the land and ocean are under threat. But the current discourse on climate change impact doesn't give voice to our cultural identity and the relationship we have with nature that is being threatened by this climate emergency. How can we center this within the global climate change discourse that seems to be dominated by financial and corporate posturing? I had the opportunity to be in Kiribati, uh, Fiji, and Vanuatu in 2015, and definitely felt what you said in a very deep personal way, stayed with me since. And I want to be blunt about it. The way we centered this is first about naming the problem that we have, climate apartheid, right. Right? right? Because those parts of the world that contributed greatest to the problem are not those parts of the world like the Pacific that is suffering the first and the most brutal impacts of climate change. And we need to recognize, therefore, that the conversation around what happened at COP26, how we understand it, we have to understand that, in fact, it's been a complete betrayal of small island states, for the folks in the Pacific, for uh, people in coastal regions, these developed countries, and so on. And our your question was, how do we centre it, right? And I think that Winona referred to, uh, implied that actually we cannot solely rely on the current systems that exist, which are broken in multiple ways. Mm -hmm. We can actually now start building new systems from below and start creating uh, ways of doing agriculture, protecting our water sources, how we relate to each other and so on, in a much more decentralized, bottom-up way. And I think because those in power know that the systems that they are defending are indefensible, that if we can organize better amongst ourselves and generate examples of how we can do things better, I think that e eventually uh, that message is going to permeate in a context where the dominant leaders in political formations and in the dominant business uh, community actually know that what they are speaking is completely bankrupt. I, I, I would agree. I think that they know. And I, and I also say, you know, I just want to give my heart out to Pacific Islanders. And you know that you are entirely reliant upon your Mother Earth and your, and your ocean for your life. You know, a lot of what we do is in recognizing the situation that you are in is the same situation we are in. And, and you know, the, the, the better we can do to stop tar sands pipelines, the better for you, you know? Yeah. I mean, that, that is my goal. You know, I've, I spent eight years fighting a pipeline that they just put in. You know, it's a crime against Mother Earth. It's a crime. You can't bring more oil out and pretend that it's going to work out. You bring it out in, in, in Canada, you burn it in the United States, uh, it's going to show up in the Pacific, you know? So all we do is, is, you know, knowing that our community is related to your community. And, um, you know, good, good prayers for you and your community. Hi, I'm Sajjad. I'm actually from Pakistan and studying in the United States. You are saying that inequality, consumerism, new liberalism, and all, all this have led to the climate, climate crisis. So, like, how do we reimagine a different future without all these aspects of our, our daily lives? You know, just remember that, like, the world we live in now is not the world that we had all this time. This is like the past, I think, of 200 years of very bad decisions, past 100 years, very bad. You know, I mean, the advent of fossil fuels acceleration, the rise of the fossil fuels agriculture system and the toxic militarization, it's kind of like being on steroids. You know, fossil fuels puts you on steroids, makes it a lot bigger and a lot faster. If you can get rid of some of the amnesia that you get from a massive fossil fuels injection and remember that there's a way to live that is a little bit more simple, that has more relations with your, your, with your relatives that are close, you know, then, then you got a better shot. Because the fact is, is that a globalized economy is predicated on a lot of fossil fuels. You know, I can get a shrimp that was raised in Scotland, deveined in China, and arrives at a Walmart near me. You know what I'm saying? This is like, that's too far for a shrimp to travel. You know, maybe we, we rebuild things that are a little more local. There's many tools, you know, ahead. I don't know, Kumi might have a better answer for this, but, uh, you know, I just think shrimp shouldn't travel. Well, I think the issue of how 
far food travels is part of the kind of change that we need to make. Also, not only because of carbon, but because of quality, yeah. <laughs> because of freshness, because of health. And I, I'm impressed that there are many young people and some older people in the global north who are beginning to recognize that actually the 200 years of so-called civilization that was pushed on us actually turns out to be pretty uncivilized, right? And the changes that we are seeking to make, right? I don't think they are sacrifices. Sacrifice is the fact that people are working 20-hour days. Sacrifice the idea that people are working three jobs just to put uh, food on the table. But what you're seeing is that all over the world today, people are actually co-creating from bottom up solution, real solutions to real problems, from providing energy to rethinking agriculture and so on. And the challenge for us right now is how do we pick up those examples? Because the problem we have is we've got a ideological state apparatus almost that is against us. You know, by, by that I'm meaning framework for education, framework for religion, social norms and custom, how we fund arts and culture, but most critically, the framework for communications and media. So today, the, you know, even being able to project new models and new ways of doing things is a challenge because we don't have enough um, capability to do that. So we have our next question already. Over to you. Hello, I'm based in the Bronx, New York, and I'm my heritage wise, I'm part of the Fulani tribe of West Africa. And I really want to know, are we saving the planet or are we saving the economy? What What is meant by this in relations to polluting countries? Um, and wouldn't new climate justice asks and policies allow for both? You know, I call this economy the Windigo economy, the economy of a cannibal. It's a cannibal economy because it consumes its life force. It consumes everything which is around and turns it into products that are then sold for some profit. You know, I heard someone say that colonialism has the same root as the word colon, which is to digest. And I, like, believe it. It's like the digestion of the entire world. You know, so now we're planet stuff. That's what someone said. We got more stuff that's human in the world than all of the biosphere, like all the elephants and all the trees and the coral reefs. You know, you just gotta change your alliance from what you shopped for in a bottle to what you're gonna, you know, how you rebuild a place to, to, to relocalize. On a worldwide scale, there is, there is this resurgence and, that, and, and continuation of local farming, of, of local health, of local energy, and, you know, in this moment, we see that that's better to survive if you aren't counting on something coming in from China, probably have better shot. That's the real economy, you know, and that's the one that we actually all rely on because, you know, as much as Jeff Bezos wants to shop in space, there's no food or water, you know? So best, best just make things good here, Jeff. Winona, I think this is a good point to wrap up this conversation uh, by bringing in Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King, speaking when I think I was a four-month-old baby, uh, said, uh, my friends, as I conclude my speech, I want to note that in the field of modern child psychology, there's a very dominant term called maladjusted. Now, all of us want to be well-adjusted and not suffer from schizophrenia or other mental illnesses. But my friends, I say to you, there are certain things in this world that are so unjust and immoral that good, decent people should refuse to adjust to. He goes on to then say, I never intend to adjust myself to religious bigotry, racial discrimination, mindless expenditure on military weapons when people don't have food to eat. Right. But on the economy, he says, I never intend to adjust myself to economic conditions that will take necessities from the many to give luxuries to the few when millions of God's children are smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in an affluent society. That if that was relevant in the mid-60s in the U.S., it's a thousand times more relevant there, and sadly, it's relevant across the world. But in an inspirational note, he called on the world to set up a movement that never was set up. He said, I call upon decent men and women around the world to set up a new international organization to be known as the International Association for the Advancement of Creative Maladjustment. So to those folks, <laughs> <laughs> to those folks that think maybe some of the things that Winona and I are saying are too out there. This is what this moment calls for. This is a moment for us 
not to adjust to things that are so fundamentally unjust. Right, that is right? true. And, and, and I think uh, this is a moment for fresh thinking, creative ideas, and so on. And we should make no apologies for putting forward ideas that sound different, transformative, and so on, when in fact the current systems are failing in every possible way. I was charged with a thousand other people. I spent three days in jail fighting a Canadian multinational and watched Biden turn his back on us. How do you think we deal with the challenge of winning people over who have been led to believe that the current system serves them?